This is a presentation of SBE 15 New York City. All right, it's time for our presentation. And I'd like to introduce Bob Cully from Lightstream Design. Here you go, Bob. Uh, thank you, uh, members of SBE uh, New York and who's ever online. Thank you for the, uh, the students here at Hofstra. It's always great to, um, to see people interested in all types of communication, radio, TV, film. Uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to show you a little bit about lighting for everything. Um, you know, I have, uh, going to introduce myself, Bob Cully, um, light stream design. I've had my own company for 31 years. I've been in the business for about 40 years. Um, starting out in, um, the early days of MTV, um, original VJs in the studio, uh, for some of you might might feel like the uh, the original TikTok. <laughs> it was a it were, was a big thing back then, um, and it really opened up a lot of people's uh, mind to the possibilities with music and music videos, and you know things have progressed rapidly with technology. So um, we're going to go into a little history of lighting. Um, and what, what has been used in the past, what is being used now, going from uh, the early days of lighting, which, uh, let there be light, you have to know what you're using, what we used in the past and still using today in some instances is tungsten light bulbs. Thomas Edison uh, invented it uh, you know, over 100 years ago, used in film for many years, used in early uh the uh, early incant incantation of uh, broadcast and uh, still used today in, in many places. It's um, something that's being phased out and it's being phased out for a reason, economics. Um, the early use of these, uh, uh, of tungsten lights was popular because it was cheap and easy to make. Um, but the economics of it are that it creates a lot of heat. So in a big studio application for news 24 seven or big productions, you're generating huge amounts of heat with all these lights. And, uh, with that, you have to have air conditioning. And with that, you have to, you have to have heavy cables, heavy maintenance and, uh, the fact that these light bulbs will only last mm, 300 to 500 hours gives you a, a time frame where it has to be replaced. If you were doing a daily newscast at a network uh, station, you would get there two hours early to turn the lights on to uh, make sure they all came up because you had hundreds of lights you got to go through on a, on a studio it would take time to go around, make sure that everything was working properly. And it wouldn't be unusual in a morning or an evening to turn on the lights and have to replace 10 or 20 bulbs because they've gone to their, uh, to their limit. Now, the, what also changed uh, was the advent in the 80s of halogen light bulbs, which were a, a brighter mixture of, uh, of tungsten, uh, gave you about 10 to 15, maybe 20% more light, created a little bit more heat. Was very useful in a lot of applications, but it also had less bulb life. So what was 300 to 500 hours became maybe 200 to 350 hours. So you, uh, you were able to use uh, the lights for a shorter amount of time, but it was more intense. You may be able to use less physical light fixtures because you had brighter ones. Um, but this was all uh, started in the, in the 80s. Technology changes. You have fluorescent lightings. Fluorescent bulbs be, were used as banks of fill lights. They had their own economics. They were fairly cheap to produce. They were fairly cheap to run because they ran on a lot less power 
than your conventional tungsten lighting. But they put out much less light. So the compensation was not a great, uh, a, a great economic boost. It was a, a cheap way to get by in some studios. And uh, it had its own disadvantages with color temperature, its own disadvantages with, with um, uh, sustainability. Um, fluorescent lighting is really going to be going, uh, going away fairly soon. Um, there's a lot of movement in, uh, the, in the EU and, and in California not to produce fluorescent bulbs anymore because they um, have mercury in them. And it's, it's something that's not sustainable and it's not easily uh, and, or economically recycled. Um, so the new technology that we've all embraced, whoops, we went too far here. Let me go back is uh is led <laughs> come on get me back here ah it's moving all right well we'll go on to led lighting or led strip lighting which you'll you'll notice uh you may notice back here they've had some nice led lights for uh for their uh wall washes here and that um that's tunable to any color temperature you want. You can, uh, you can make them warm, cool. You can, uh, you can make, I mean, you can make them uh, warm white or cool white. So uh, you have a, a nice mixture. Um, the newer models have light engines that can do RGB plus warm white and cool white. So do seven different variants. And that, so in a real entertainment fixture, something you would see at a Broadway show or something you would see in, uh, in, in a, a big event like Super Bowl, you're going to have all kinds of uh, color and flash and all that can be done quite economically with um, LED lighting. So LEDs use about one-tenth the amount of power of um the, your conventional tungsten lighting they produce um a higher uh looms per watt so you're getting about 10 times the value for um the wattage you know you can replace a bulb in your house 75 watt bulb with a 7 watt led bulb these days so you know you're you're getting um much more efficient usage you're getting less heat so all these big studios, all these big events don't have to have the air conditioning. They don't have to have the heavy cables that bring all the power um, to these venues. So you're saving money also on maintenance. The maintenance uh, uh, on these uh, lights is fairly ne negligible. Most of the, uh, the uh, LEDs have... Um, between 20,000 and 50,000 hours. So you're going from a quartz light that has 500 hours to a LED light that has 20,000 hours to 50,000 hours. And that's maintaining 80% capacity and efficiency. Um, there's, there's still some first generation LED lights that I put in studios that are still working 12, 14 years later. Um, th these are, it's a very economical turn for, um, all these, uh, studios and a lighting designer has to use what he's given and what he's given now is LEDs and these LEDs, um, will make a difference in a lot of instances because their control and now they're controlled by DMX or RDM. So there's, a, there's a bunch of different um, um, codes that'll do it through, through lighting, computer lighting boards that you can focus a light, you can move a light, you can change the color of a light, you can change the, the uh, texture of a light. On <clears throat> some of these moving lights, you can put frosts in, you can put hard light, hard streams in them. So a lot of this stuff 
has uh, has really pushed the advance of lighting design. But to know where we've came from, we go back to the early days. And you'll see this is an early studio, uh, un not unlike the studio we have here. It's probably an early CBS studio with banks of lights, quartz lights, scoops, 1Ks. All this stuff was put together for shows in the early 50s, like uh, I Love Lucy. Now, I Love Lucy came, came about uh, as a co-production between CBS and Desi Lou Productions, which was Desi Arnaz and Lucio Ball. Now, they had the comedy. They had the audience. So uh, they put on a great show. But in those days, to put on a show, you filmed it with a film camera, edited it, and put it on a kinescope, which showed it on, on a, a TV. The process was very involved. To do a normal situation comedy, it would take a week of rehearsal, lighting, and shooting. It would take many more days of editing and sound looping. And what the, the model of the day then was, took about three weeks to do a production, to put on a half hour sitcom on CBS on a Friday night or a Sunday night. So they only produced eight or nine of them a year. And the whole economics changed when it became so popular. I Love Lucy at one point had 30% of the TV audience at any one night. Now, the TV audience was a lot smaller then, but still the advertisers figuring 30% market. And even at one point when Lucy was pregnant and had her, was having, introducing her baby after a baby was born, that particular show had about a 70% share of the market for that hour on a Sunday night. Unheard of. Advertisers flocked to it. So CBS wanted more shows not just eight or nine a year, they wanted 22 a year. And then they wanted 39 a year. So how do you produce that? You produce that by doing a multi-camera, multi-lighting setup, and you do it in one day. And you turn it around and edit it in two or three other days, and you have it at the end of a week. And that's what the start of multi-camera lighting design really goes back to. Lucille Ball and I Love Lucy, they proved the economics of it and they pushed the industry and the technology of the time. And even though they did use film cameras, they used three film cameras and they, ed and they edited it um, night, you know, that very night. They, uh, they pushed the old time honeymooner one setup one big theater kind of show into a multi-set environment, multi-lighting. And, you know, it, it transferred all the way down to the 70s, all in the family, into the, uh, into the 90s with Seinfeld. It was all shot the same way. The technology advanced some more. The, uh, the cameras advanced. Everything, uh, you know, was on tape instead of on film, but the lighting design and the lighting setups pretty much stayed, stayed the same for many, many years. And again, using traditional um, tungsten lighting. Now, even in the, in the newer sitcoms, say the Big Bang Theory, uh, obviously they're using, uh, uh, again, more technology and they're, they're, probably in, into this at this point using the early um, LED lights. Now, the early LED lights was, was just a mixture of cool white and warm white, which was not a full spectrum light. A full spectrum light, like a quartz light, has elements of color from the full spectrum from the greens to the blues to the reds to the orange. It may spike at 3,200 Kelvin, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but it has a full spectrum. So color rendition, which is very important in setup, where you want all the cameras to look at the same objects and see the same color. The lighting has to be the same. 
and it has to be the same color temperature so that the color can be reproduced to a, a much more exact tone. Um, when you got into um, LED lights, the early ones did not have full spectrum. So it was very difficult to maintain a color rendering in, in index, the CRI, above 70, which is not very, not real good. Um, or that was the early version of them. But because they were saving so much economically, they pushed forward and they pushed the technology. Now, most LEDs, uh, their color rendering index is cheap ones are 90 to 93 percent expensive lights that are that are the then i mean uh, 97 to 98 percent on the on the cri scale so you've got a really accurate light to work with now you've got a really accurate color rendition to work with and they've uh, progressed in obviously it shows a little modern studio with LED lights on stands, but how to light correctly. This is, you're using your tools now, you're using your tungsten lighting, using your LED lighting, how to use your tools correctly is a uh, part of this. And the essence from the very beginning of a multi-camera setup stays the same. You're staying with, you have a key light, a fill light. Now, in some cases, you're adding side light and a backlight. Now, why do you have those lights? Well, the key light, obviously, you have a front light so that the camera can pick up technically enough light to reproduce a picture. But it, is that always pleasing? No, not always. It has to be at the right angle. It has to be at the right softness sometimes. Um, but they're, they're, you move on to the next level, and the next level is adding your fill lights. You add your fill lights uh, basically at 45 degrees off of your key light, which your key light is usually based on a, on a specific close-up camera. And once you've done that, you've more wrapped a face, you've wrapped a, a, a person uh, in light, you've caused them... Uh, to have a little bit better definition than just a flat front-on light. Now, when you go to backlight, you add a little separation, and that goes back to Renaissance painting. I mean, it goes back to the Italian masters, and they had a thing they, they called chioscuro. Chioscuro was basically just light and shadow. And what it's doing is it's forcing perspective a little bit to give you a little separation from the background and what it what it means is that you're looking at a two-dimensional product you're looking at a, a tv screen and your eyes which are stereoscopic you're trying to it's trying to create depth it's looking for something to give it some perception and uh, the backlight is what helps give you that depth in that perception. So you're adding a nice backlight on somebody. You're separating them from the background. You're causing the, the situation to progress further that you're, you're giving yourself a, um, a, nice, a nice look for the person while you're, you're dealing with um, whatever setup you want. Now, you start with a single person, it's a single light over a camera, that's your key light. And that's useful in all uh, kinds of situations for news, for ENG pickups. Um, you know, you can use the, the sun or at a street light for a back for a back light if you if uh, if possible, if it's not too bright a day, or dark at night. So there, there, there's use for every kind of light. Now, when you go into zoom calls sometimes the use of these li lights are not right um a lot of people have used ring lights for for zoom calls now ring lights were developed as a, a light to surround a camera lens 
for basically fashion shoot commercials when someone's doing makeup when someone's doing uh you know uh eye cream uh, or skin cream or or um eyelash commercials the camera would get in so close that physically you couldn't light them without causing a shadow unless you put a ring right around the lens and that's what the the ring light was developed for now it was used a lot for zoom calls um you're you're made to have a lens right in the center so your your iphone or or wherever you are you're using which should be right in the center to make it work but it's also made that it wasn't supposed to be more than a foot away from a person's face otherwise you start losing the intensity you start losing the wash effect of this um, ring light oh you know a lot of zoom calls could could easily be done nicely with a with a a, a a light on a stand, you know, a regular table light next, next to your, um, your, um, computer, but, you know, we move on and you can do sing, uh, single lights or uh, a few lights and you can have streaming. You can have streaming for podcasts, for radio stations. If it's done correctly and it's placed right, you can have a nice pleasing look so that the background has some information, but it doesn't overpower people, that people look good because you want your guests to look good on any of these shows or podcasts or radio stations because they, they want to come back. If they don't look good, then they're not going to come back or the word is going to get out. You don't want to go there because it looks like hell. <laughs> um, you know, the idea of a key light, a backlight and a fill light translates no matter how big a production you get now you start with like a two-person desk and you start with um you know the surrounding them with light because you have three or four cameras on them you start with the close-up camera you put the key light over the uh, over the close-up camera you surround them with a nice wrap of fill light and you give them separation with a nice backlight and that is control for each and individual uh, talent that you have there. So each one has a separate key light. Each one has a separate backlight. They may share some fill lights, but the, but the balance will be there no matter what their skin tone. So you're maintaining the same kind of ratios. Also, um, you're, your fill lights are at 45 degrees of your, your key lights. Your, your backlights are less intense than your, than your key lights. Um, all this kind of stuff gives you a ple nice, pleasing look. And it translates up when you're doing four people on a desk or a sports studio where people getting up and walking over to TV monitors, where they're walking over to big screens, they're, tossing around a football or, uh, you know, pretending they're batting or something like that. All this stuff is all laid out in the same kind of lighting design. You have to have a key light. You have to have fill lights. You have to have backlights. And the placement of all of this is critical to having a, a nice, pleasing picture, a beautiful shot. We want, you know, even for events, you go to, to shareholder meetings, you go to, to uh, introductions for car shows, you do all this kind of stuff for events, and it's the same premise. You want to have a key light at some point. You want to have fill lights that will be put at the right angle so it'll be nice and pleasing. Some of the stuff I've done in the past has translated up from, like I said, starting at MTV back in the early 80s, uh, doing The Daily Show, um, starting in the late 90s. We went to uh, conventions and we did live shows. This, uh, this is The Daily Show set up in um, 2017 in their studio and just showing a light, a light uh, chart that we make up for different areas so people could walk all over in front of monitors, 
be four or five people at the desk, uh, walk over and do areas where we did um, um, bands sometimes or demonstrations. All this stuff um, all had this the same kind of uh, um, design in that you're lighting the people and you're lighting the background separately. The backgrounds all had to be integrated into what the set was, what the theme was. You know, you, your colors were driven by what um, what the set design started with, what your graphics, you have a whole graphics package when you do any of these uh, news or entertainment programs, and you have to coordinate the lighting with that. Um, this is early MTV uh, little plot with uh, Martha Quinn and Ozzy Osbourne interviewing at a little uh, thing we used to call Sam's desk in the middle of the studio. Um, you know, back then it was a whole uh, different kind of look. It was it was made to be um, a little left or center, a little rock and roll, supposedly. Um, but. These, these were people that wanted to be on air. They wanted their music to be out there. So they sat down for interviews and, uh, and someone had a light up and I was part of that. And you go to later on, we did a lot of late night uh, bands uh, on the, on the daily show. We did Foo Fighters, Arcade Fire, Bruce Springsteen, um, you know, uh, a ton of different bands and lighting design changes a little bit more when you go into the entertainment section of this, you do still have key lights and backlights and fill lights, you know, but for the purpose of uh, musical performance, you drop the fill lights, you add um, some flash and trash in the background, as we call it, to uh, to get some excitement to build the music like the the uh, you know whatever whatever their their type of music is and uh, when then they come out and they interview them we got to you know bring up the fill lights fill it in talk to the entertainers talk to them it's it's all pretty much the same kind of um, same kind of stuff uh, that's. When I added some, well, I added something at the end here. Um, you're all probably familiar with the Super Bowl halftime show. Rihanna did a, they did a fantastic job doing that. Now it's a, f a fantastic job of lighting also, but they maintain the same lighting uh, design and they maintain the same look. They have hundreds of lights, most of which are used for what we call the flash and trash. There's seven strong gladiators there it are follow spots. And that's basically what the key light on her at all times was. Whatever angle she went to, whatever up and down she floated in the, in the uh, stadium, there was a different follow spot f uh, following her. And uh, they had flying nav cams. So they had to have flying. Uh, they had to have uh, follow spots on on uh, flying rigs also, and that's basically what what lit her with obviously all the other color lighting, the, the huge field lighting, the huge amount of dancers going up and down. But you're basically doing the same thing. You're you're making sure the proper placement of the key light and where the camera is and adding backlight, color, side light, the uh, fill light, whatever is needed for the environment. In an entertainment venue like, like the Super Bowl, they have a huge budget, so they're going to spend a huge amount of money on lights. And you see it on the screen. You end up seeing all that stuff on the screen. But to light people properly, you, you just have to maintain the proper placement of your key light, your backlights, your fill lights. And that's, uh, that's pretty much where we're, where we're at. Um, there are, you know, exceptions to all the rules. Once you, you generate a rule for lighting, there are reasons to break it. When you're in a drama, 
when you're doing, uh, you know, the Game of Thrones, you're going to have darkness. <laughs> and that, there's a reason for that. And that and that's proper lighting in, in the aspect for um, that production. But, you know, you're 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 still maintaining that there's um, a key light for each person, whether it's motivated from a, a bowl of fire or a torch or whatever. Um, you, you have to see people properly to, uh, to, uh, to maintain that intimate contact, which is, is what they're going for, for all these, uh, these productions. Um, part of what we do is, uh, I have a couple of little stand lights here, or this little stand light here that shows you what um, what's possible now with a very inexpensive LED light. Um, this one can change color, RGB. It's, uh, let's see here, if I can change this one. It's upside down. <laughs> I can change the color temperature quite easily on this by just adjusting a few switches. This one is not adjusting as quickly as I thought. <laughs> but this, this is possible to, uh, to, in a $100 light or less, to, to light up a podcast, uh, light up a little streaming radio show, a couple of these properly placed. I mean, these things run on battery for an hour to an hour and a half. Um, you can, you can maintain a production. So the economics of lighting and lighting design has changed tremendously. Um, but you know, you still need to know your equipment. You need to know where it's placed and how to do it. Um, there's certain reference you use, um, you use a light meter. These light meters are um, have changed in technology from being the, the basic intensity uh, light meters to know how intense uh, each light is and how to set up your ratios, which is very important to being uh, color temperature meters and correction meters on some of these you'll you'll be you won't be able to see it up close here but they have a whole scale of gels you can use so you can match uh lights to maintain the same color temperature um they'll, they'll have a basis say you want to shoot at 30 to 200 kelvin which is basically a warm light which is kind of what you're used to in your home, you know, your, your color temperature in your home lighting is probably anywhere from 27 to 3,200 Kelvin. Very important in any production to keep it consistent for the video. Um, so the video can be consistent. So a light meter is a handy tool for anybody who's, who's doing uh, lighting and designing it. Um, you know, lights, color temperature is, a, is another aspect that changes. Um, for the needs of the production. Part of what we do uh, is match, if we're doing presentations, um, there, if there's a lot of video presentations, there's a lot of video screens, their color correction is, you know, their native color, color temperature for most projectors and most uh, uh, TV screens can be anywhere from 6,000 Kelvin to 9,000 Kelvin. They're very, um, spiky they're very on the blue side so sometimes we'll bring the color temperature up for the lighting for the people involved interacting with those to 5600 which is a, which is a basic daylight color temperature um this this maintains a little bit closer color uh cri and that the person and what they're wearing and and what the set looks like and what the uh, presentation looks like uh, in the video screen will be a lot closer to, to um, what, what is real life, a lot more accurate. Um, you know, for most, uh, most people, it's um, a very easy 
change to do now with uh, with the computer boards and with the LED lights. It's just a touch of the button. So um, these productions can happen very rapidly, very easily. Um, some of the other stuff that we'll do in in news is that they can they can uh, you know toss out uh, from uh, the the studio to an ENG shot and uh, and match color color wise so that uh, they don't have to color correct every shot because it's it's just a uh, a difficult in instance when people are using their phones to report news events they're they're using tiny lipstick cameras or dash cams so you know we can adapt in the studio to what's whatever's needed on the outside world um any other uh the uses uh let's see we go back there yep no well we're not going back real quick <laughs> Anyway, um, we've dealt with uh, the lighting design and we dealt with uh, what the demonstrations are. You know, obviously you have a key light in the front and you want to keep it at a certain height so that you're um, creating a little bit of uh, a little bit of texture on them, a little bit of shadow, but you fill in the side so it's not too deep. And you end up putting a nice, a nice backlight to give them separation. It's the basics of all lighting design. So uh, if there's any questions, anything that... Uh, sure. Yeah. How many students here have taken lighting or learned a bit about lighting in class? So 10 or 12 people have taken lighting class. Yeah. 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 And uh, the folks that are on Zoom uh, watching this from the comfort of their own home, uh, I like the way the teleprompter is going here. Like, yeah, we'll, we'll... Have you agreed to what break that? Uh, that was... <laughs> uh, so anyway, there's a lot of folks in the Society of Broadcast Engineers who work in radio. And the thing is these days is there's a video element to radio, to film, to TV, to newspapers. Uh, look at the, you know, any of the USA Today is on their website. There's video. Everybody has to know how to do a little bit of video and everybody has to know a little bit of lighting. I get very annoyed on Zoom calls when uh, somebody looks like they're a zombie possessed or whatever because they have their window, the lights coming through the window and there's no light in front of them. So uh, there's a lot of creatures uh, to be seen. Uh, one thing I wanted to see if we could do here, can we bring one of the students up here as a, as a demo person? Don't worry, we're not going to hurt you. <laughs> no harm will be done. As far as they know. Yes. How you doing? I'm Jeff. Mike. Mike. Hey, Mike. That's Bob. He's been talking for a while. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Mike in a chair here. You can sit right there. Let's say uh, uh, we're doing this great YouTube video of you. You're going to be telling us about your great experience here uh, at Hofstra University and tell us about the college radio station. So, so um, we will have what our uh, our phone here as the camera, right? And Bob, okay. So we got we got one light to work with. Right? So well, we got, we're going to put this light right in front of them. No, we, we, when you place, uh, if you're doing a single camera, you're going to put a light over the top of the camera, okay, and, and give it some height so that you have uh, a little bit of uh, angle downward on them. Not much. It's a washing effect. And if someone has glasses, like he has glasses, yeah, the reflection you want to lose. So you, you do, um, it's kind of like the, it's geometry, the incidence of the angle. So you, you're looking for 22 degrees um, up and you'll, uh, you'll lose the reflection, will come down to the ground and not into the camera. Uh, okay, let's go crazy. Let's say you have two lights. Yes. Doing, we're, still, we're still on the iPhone or right. whatever. So how are we doing? Well, two lights, you're going to cross light. You're gonna put kind of like what you have here is you're, you're gonna have two lights crossing, but you wanna make sure that they were even evenly in the intensity, exactly the same intensity, so that when they wash across there, they're, they're not causing um, a large shadow. Um, you're also maintaining the same height. So you wanna have 
uh, unless someone has a really deep set eyes, you still want to maintain about 20 degrees, 22 degrees uh, for the light uh, angle up, up uh, above the camera. And uh, what happens is you'll, you'll add these fill lights on either side, these two cross lights, and they'll fill in the shadows underneath the neck and underneath the eyes, underneath the nose, so that you'll have a, a nice pleasing look without having a deep um, dramatic shadows. Let's wrap it here. Uh, does everybody in this room have a phone with a camera on it? Or is that the dumbest question you've ever heard? Right, right. So I have seen, and you'll probably scoff at this, a Home Depot work light. Yes, you can, you can use whatever you have available. And even the Home Depot work lights um, that are, some of them are battery operated. And that, as long as you maintain a, a, um, a consistency, in other words, if you're using one element like a work light, you maintain that it, it's uh, whatever color temperature it is, you can use your camera to kind of balance um, what is white. Your camera wants, the, the cameras are sophisticated enough that whatever light you're using for a, for a single light, for lighting somebody, it's going to want to make it look um, as close to balanced for a skin tone as possible. So they'll, some of them will automatically adjust for it. So you can use a $30, uh, you know, Home Depot work light and put it at the right angle and maintain the right, um, the right look. You'll, you'll have a nice pleasing effect um, on your talent. And uh, any of the other additions to that, you want to keep as consistent. So if you have two of these work lights, you want to make sure that they're pretty much the same intensity, the same distance away, because distance from a light from a person means the amount of intensity that falls on them. Is it better to have more lights or less? Um, you have to remember, more li each light causes a shadow. So the more lights you have, the more shadows you have. So if it's not something that you definitely need, you want to keep it simple. And especially if you're doing podcasts or, or streaming a small radio uh, program, you want to keep it simple. If there's only one camera uh, from one angle, then you can get away with one or two or maybe three lights uh, max. You don't have to get super sophisticated for a situation like that. All right, let's open it up on the floor. Anyone have any questions for Bob? Uh, and also, we can talk a little bit about his career, which you've seen a few of the slides that uh, stuff Bob's worked on. He's worked on The Daily Show. 20 years on The Daily Show. Um, I did a lot of stuff in the 80s, like MTV, and then I did CBS Sports. Back in uh, the early days, not every arena was lit to specifications for uh, sports. So they would bring me in to St. John's University, Fordham in the Bronx, and hang lights to maintain uh, the functional technical ability of 200 foot candles. We're probably sitting here at about 50 foot candles, maybe 60 foot candles. Um, back in the day when cameras were not as sophisticated, lenses were, were very expensive, they would bring me into to all these venues to add additional lighting for for um, some of these colleges and some of these uh, um, uh, gymnastic schools. We did stuff for for um, Olympic trials for figure skating, Olympic trials for gymnastics, and all that stuff had to be lit at a certain level. And if you weren't in a major venue they didn't have the te technical capability at the time. So they would bring in consultants like myself. So I have a quick story. I used to work at ABC television uh, uh, at the network and we had the soap operas in New York and ABC sports. And you couldn't believe how bad the sets look in person, especially the soap opera set. <laughs> the, uh, the backgrounds looked like they were painted by junior high students. But when they put up the lights, it was like, art happened and it really hit me of what an art lighting is that if you're going to do a program you got to know what you're doing it makes a severe difference 
from poor lighting to good lighting. And if you don't believe me, watch public access TV sometime. Uh, prime example of that. Uh, I've got my earpiece in. Uh, let's open it up on the floor of the Zoom call if anybody has any questions. One of the questions that I had was uh, Bob gave us some uh, ranges of what the uh, the lighting intensity is supposed to be. For, for your typical um, laptop camera or these uh, external... So it's lighting a question. <laughs> uh, yeah, for the external cameras that you can buy for your computer to do Zoom, what what would be the right um, uh, intensity? Yeah, the Kelvin twenty seven hundred okay. fifty six thousand fifty six hundred. Okay. Well, no, the, there's as intensity intensity is measured in lumens oh, or foot Kelvin. or or right. foot candles. The the color temperature okay. is me measured in kelvins. So what what will answer both then? Right. Right. Well, it, for a Zoom call, for your, a normal camera pickup out of a a, a, um, a, a computer, yeah. or uh, your phone, you, you're you're looking at only like twenty foot candles of light is is plenty for those cameras. Well, you um, when you buy a, a light for your for your laptop, it's not going to say foot candles on it. Really? it it'll say lumens uh, on it, so and like your normal uh, a normal um, desk clamp is about 800 lumens uh that translates in a 10 to 1 ratio it's about eight foot candles so you're you're on the edge with losing using just a normal uh, table lamp say for lighting you you can technically do it um and you can make it if it's soft enough and, and uh reflective enough that you, you're going to get enough intensity out of it um, but the color temperature for for a normal lamp is like 3200 or 2900 Kelvin. So you see a, a bulb that says just, you know, regular Home Depot a bulb that's daylight versus soft white. What is the difference? Daylight is 5600 Kelvin. And it's or if it's uh, if, if it's a LED light, it's what they call cool white. And what is normally used indoors for a, uh, for a um, regular table light is uh, is warm uh, warm uh, uh, light, which is like I said, twenty nine to thirty two hundred Kelvin, and it's a, a soft white is somewhere it can be somewhere in the middle of that. It can be about four thousand degrees Kelvin. Um, so it translates a little bit of the warm. Or if you're on a Zoom call, you want something softer. Well, you want something softer, and you want generally want something warmer because warmer enhances your skin tones and makes you seem a little bit more lively. The worst thing you can get is somebody that looks so pasty or so white that they they look like they're they're ill, or somebody who's gonna who's who's lighting. If you're using sometimes the the the, um, the 5600 Kelvin, depending on the type of bulb, you, LED bulb you have, there may be a little bit of green in it. And it's something that, that you don't want to see on somebody's face is a little bit of a green tint <laughs> when you're doing a Zoom call. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, thanks, uh, Conrad. Did that answer your so, question? So 20-foot candles around 3,000 Kelvin. Yes. Okay. And 20-foot okay. candles. Uh, Bob, can you talk about side lights? You, you talked about key light and fill light. Are sides, looking at your pictures earlier, your drawings, they were like 90 degrees off from key lights. Is that, give us some detail on that. Yes, yeah, side lights are 90 degrees off. There, there's a, there's the, the typical setup that I, that I gave you here is what they call three-point lighting. There's another setup that is used called four-point lighting, where you use extreme 90-degree side light. And that's used in some instances when people do dramatic camera turns. Like they'll the uh on sometimes in the morning news, they'll they'll do a nice little two-shot with two people, you know laughing it off and starting the day on the on the news cycle and then they'll go into the individual stories and they'll turn to to a, a close-up camera which is almost 90 degrees uh off <clears throat> right and that's when you use four-point lighting where you use a uh an equal amount of intensity all around the person so that they can turn to whatever side 
and be equally lit and equally filled on that. So side lighting can be very important. It's, uh, it, it can be used in, in news and sports and, and, and a, lot of other, uh, a lot of other areas, but it's specific to a situation. Jeff, we have a question on the chat. Yes. It's, what do you recommend for a key and fill instrument, a panel light or a single source light, such as a what Fresnel? For a key light, you, you really, um, it really looks much better if you have a single source uh, softened key light, kind of like we have in, in the front here. It's not softened as much, but it's a single source. Um, a lot of the fill lights um, are, it, you really want, you can use a multiple source light and LED. Um, the single source lights uh, give you a little bit more punch. A key light should uh, be a ratio of slightly more than your fill light. Your fill light, your two or three fill lights around the side of you should be about, uh, you know, if you're lighting for, for uh, a pickup, it's 40 or 50 foot candles total. It should be about 20, 25 cumulative for all your fill light. The rest of the light comes is your key light. So you're looking at 20% at of a, hard, a little harder light from your single source from the front. Yeah, I have a, a quick question, Jeff. Yeah, is that Keith? Yes. Thanks, Mike. Hi, hi Bob, Jeff. A terrific presentation. You got you guys do nice work. That and Andy. We're, we're gonna bring Andy Gladding up too. Yes, Keith. Yes, this this is great. <laughs> Bob, you know what? Yeah, he gets applause. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, hi, Andy. Okay, Keith, you got a quick question? Come into yeah. the light. <laughs> you, you've made a very complicated. Uh, uh, business what's, what's seems question? simple and terrific. Bob, where do you see, is there anything new on, coming up? There, there's always new technology. Um, LED seems to be the, the uh, prominent one right now. There, there's all kinds of other stuff that they're working on. Um, that, no, they, it, you know, they, just like the, the, uh, the TVs that you buy have changed dramatically over the last 10 or 15 years and all the different um, lights they they've used for for that these old um, lighting for uh, for the backlighting for these uh, television sets they've worked on those for 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 lights too and it's just not economically feasible they're just not as powerful in a in a source environment that we're we're looking for but uh, technology always moves forward. There's always, and it's, you have to stay on top of it. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. I have a fast question. Sure. A lot of, a lot of people that are doing shows, especially here, are always going to have a monitor behind them to either play graphics up. Any cheap alternatives for that? Cheap alternatives for monitors for behind, you know, like a, a recommendation? Recommendation? No, I, I'm really not your technical monitor kind of guy, but I possibly answer. So, uh, used to have frame sinks. Okay. Don't need them no more. You can uh, put almost any high quality monitor behind you. Uh, yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, so a Andy is our secretary for uh, Society of Broadcast Engineers, Chapter 15, and he's been instrumental at getting us to do some activities here and collaborating with WRHU and Hofstra University, uh, which was nice enough to feed us tonight and bring uh, you young folks here to eventually replace us in our jobs uh, when you graduate. Um, Thanks again, Andy. Uh, thanks to John Mullins, who is not in the room at the moment. Thanks to, to Cameron for uh, setting this up uh, with the cameras and the, the feed. That was great. This is the first time we've ever done a hybrid. And next month, we're going to be over at Cumulus Media, Vesey Street, in person and also on Zoom. We're going to continue to do hybrid to get as many people as we can involved with all our activities. And we're gonna to try to have it in different locations uh, every month so people can make it in person. So uh, yet again, we hit 7.30, it's dinner time for some of you folks out there. Thanks so much, thanks everybody here. Just hang on, you folks, uh, we got something for you here. And we'll see you next month uh, over at Cumulus with, uh, uh, we have Kirk Harnack with Telos. And Kirk is, uh, Kirk's great, Kirk's uh, very animated. 
You'll love them. All right. Have a good night, everybody. And we'll see you next month. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Please remember to subscribe to SBE 15 New York City.